Hey, how's it going, everybody? If you clicked on the link to this video, I'm assuming you want to learn about StarCraft. I'm going to provide you a short, sweet, in-depth, not so much, <laughs> view on the game that is StarCraft. Um, it'll probably be a four-part series, very short videos, hopefully. Um, especially the last three won't be too long. But Kaldor, a known commentator and caster in the StarCraft community, put out a video on February 14th talking about the future of esports, RTS games, and where StarCraft's going to be and the kind of role it plays. One of the things he mentioned is it's kind of a difficult thing to get into if you haven't played or you don't know StarCraft very well. You can jump in, you can see a lot of different things going on. The casters are mentioning and talking about all kinds of stuff. It is really, really overwhelming. Um, other games which are a little bit easier to and the community is really flocked around is things like MOBAs and uh, like he mentioned Warcraft 3 where you have heroes, um, single characters casted, the run by <laughs> a single player. So when you join a game like League of Legends and you only got 10 things going on and you can learn and it's easier to kind of catch up and figure out what's going on without having 8,000 different things going on at the same time, like you can have it, you know, end games in StarCraft. Um, so I'm going to create a short video series, hopefully explain some of the bare basics. This first one, I'm going to go over units, um, building structures, just kind of what you're going to see when you get in, what they do, kind of their strengths and weakness. It's not going to be very, very in-depth at all. There's a whole plethora of information you can find out there. Um, Teamliquid.net got a great forums. You can go and ask questions. There's our StarCraft. Uh, be careful there, though. Um, then you got people like Day9 in the community. If you go to Day9.tv, they have all kinds of information. They get more in-depth. They're going <laughs> to they're gonna provide you with a lot of resources you can use to learn this game probably far better than I ever will um, so you know let's just hop right into it and see what's going on all right coming up oh I forgot to mention coming up is probably uh, one of the better things to start with um, if you're gonna learn the game you gotta watch the game period on April 5th Korea I believe it is April 4th our time 10 p.m. Pacific 1 a.m. April 5th East Coast you have the GSL Code S finals this is kind of StarCraft um, World Series so to speak the best of the best are going to be there so without getting again in too much depth and detail and to keep this video somewhat short I'm only gonna go after go after the players that are in there their characters you got Protoss for example and you're gonna have Zerg um, I can go into different matchups, but mirror matchups are completely different for each race, whether it's Terran, Terran, Protoss, Protoss, and then you get all the matchups of all the different races, and, you know, if this video gets some traction you guys enjoy, it, maybe I can go into that later, but right now we'll keep it simple, just so you guys can sit down, watch the GSL Code S finals, you know, appreciate the best of the best in the game, and hopefully get some sort of appreciation. All right, so when the game starts, this is what you're basically going to see, all right? Now this is a unit builder, so I'm going to send them off to die because you don't need them. The Protoss has one very important structure. It's called the pylon. It's this white spinning thing, and this is what they use and have to build all of their structures inside of that powers them. It's basically a power grid that you'll see created. And, uh, gateway, if I can uh, get my hack keys right here. This is the very first structure you're going to see. This is where they build all their units out of. You'll see them down here. They're already, uh, well, it's underneath my webcam. You can't see it, but they build their basic structures. In the very start of the game, the only unit they're really going to have access to after mining minerals and gas, which is the entire point, is to get your economy up to build better and better units, get your tech levels up and your upgrades, is going to be a zealot, for example, which is this guy. He's a little slow, but he's very strong early. Um, he's a melee fighter, so you have to get real close, do the damage. He's not exactly a range guy. There are certain upgrades that you can have. Um, charge speed, which will again speed him up, and again, that you don't need to worry about too much just yet if you just want to get into what each person does. Next thing you're going to notice is a cybernetics core. This is what allows uh, gateway research. When you get gateway research, instead of having to build them at the actual structure, what this allows you to do as Protoss is put a pylon out on the map, generally within a close vicinity of your enemy, ba uh, enemy base, and then you'll be able to drop your enemy in there and warps them in. Um, this is something that every Protoss is going to have fairly early on in the game. You're generally going to be almost the first thing you get and then they're going to go along their tech tree. Um, a lot of the more popular routes are going to be when you start getting things such as blink in that charge I mentioned. Um, if you take a look at the charge 
Uh, I don't know if he's gonna charge on his own, guys, actually. We'll see. Nope. <laughs> Alright, but you can blink with these, which is basically they teleport, and then you have a short cooldown before you can do it again. This right here is really the, uh, what we call meat and potatoes of the Protoss army. It shoots up, it's fairly quick, it allows you to get in, get out, it's a very mobile and useful unit. The Zealots, on the other hand, as I showed you beforehand, are very good at cannon fodder. They're alright early game for blocking off walls atop your ramp, which is stuff I'll get in when I get to my early game video. Other creatures you're definitely going to end up seeing um, are going to be sentries. Again, these are a great unit. You see them a lot of early on, and they perform exceptionally well, especially in uh, Zerg versus Protoss games. I'm sure you'll definitely see these guys come out. They have a few abilities down here. One of them is called Force Field, and this allows you to put down an immovable object that can only be destroyed by um, things such as Ultralisks and Colossus, which I'll get to later on, which are big, big units. So basically allows you to shut off certain areas of the map in a fight. You'll see them use them to cut unit armies in half in order to cut down the numbers they actually have to face up to. Because the way the Protoss army works is these units aren't cheap. All right, This one guy is going to cost you 100 minerals. If you're Zerg, I've got the same setup over here, these two lings only cost you 50. So, here you are with four guys compared to his one. That being said, you'll notice that they don't have um, just health. They actually have health and shields. It didn't show it on my screen for some reason, but kind of like the buildings here. They have health and shields they use. And I'll get more into the zerglings in a minute, so you don't have to worry about those. And then as you get up more up your tech tree, as you get more advancements, more buildings built, um, you might see things such as... Uh, a dark shrine. Hopefully you never see these. I hate these. <laughs> a dark shrine builds these guys. Now you can see them, but they kind of got that clear halogen color. In a game, they're actually invisible. As you can see, they are always cloaked. Um, I don't know why it shows health bars for that one, but not the other ones. It's kind of weird. <laughs> but they're always cloaked, and they can be morphed into things like archons. Generally doesn't happen so much. Um, early game. If you see Dark Templar Shrine being built, generally they're either trying to catch up or something else is going on. They hit hard, they're invisible, and you need some sort of detection, which again I get into more in the mid and late game sort of strategies rather than the early game defenses and cheeses you'll get to. But um, but you don't just need Dark Templar to turn into Archons, you can also turn the High Templar, which are these guys who also have special abilities such as Feedback which will do energy damage for um, like medevacs for example it'll turn your energy into um, actual physical damage so it works a lot for decent units like that um, they have something called storm which again you'll, I guarantee you'll see at some point in the GSL finals which basically puts an area damage does AOE damage and you kinda gotta move out of it you don't wanna take it all but it's a very great at controlling crowd sort of thing if you get a lot of guys coming in you can drop a few storms you know, with a few force fields, it's very, very powerful. This army right here can actually do quite a bit. These guys can also turn the Archons. Now, with the Archon advantage is they are a little bit slower. And a general rule of thumb is the slower it is, uh, the bigger it is, the more powerful it is, and the more important it is in the game. You're not always going to see a lot of these guys. But against Zerg, for example, they do a boost in damage as well as shooting up and down. So these are multi just like these. These guys can shoot up and down, but they're kind of... I forget what they used to call them, but they're basically little... Uh, little tickle rays. They don't do a whole lot of damage. They're not really great in a fight other than their force fields. Um, these guys can do decent damage, especially with upgrades and charge. But they use the most as cannon fodder, as I mentioned earlier. Um, another thing you're going to notice, the robotics facility. A lot of things they're going to see out of that are, this is a staple unit. You'll see at least every game is an observer. Not every game, but most games. What it is, is invisible. As you notice, the same color as the DTs, and this allows you to put anywhere on the map and gives you vision, which is very, very important, so you can see what's kind of going on. Another unit you have over here is a warp prism. This has two functions. The first function is it can actually act like a pylon, just like one of these buildings here. And this will allow you to actually warp in units underneath it, but it's also a transport. So, with this guy, you can go around. Alright, generally you can drop guys in your base. While they're dropping guys, you can warp in more guys, right? To continue the fight, so you get a lot of warp prism harass. It's great for getting around, similar to the medevac in um, for Terran, except it doesn't have exactly the healing properties as it would normally. 
Um, another one you're going to see a lot, I guarantee, in this one is Immortals. They do a lot of damage to Roaches, which I'll explain for the Zerg units later. They only take 10 damage. Doesn't matter what you hit them with for the shield per hit. Now, if you have a high DPSing creature, such as a Zerglings, actually, they hit multiple times for a little bit of damage, it'll bleed these down a lot quicker. Rather than something that hits for 50 damage, it only takes 10 until the shields are depleted, then it takes the full damage. These guys also have uh, increased damage versus armor, so they're great against things like roaches or even tanks. Again, tanks for Terran, splash damage. Um, does a lot normally, but it only do 10 here, as opposed to other things, so it's great at breaking those lines. And, of course, the staple of a Protoss army, or Death Ball, as you like to call it, is going to be the Colossus, these giant giraffe-looking things with the big heads. Um, kind of look like helmets in... Uh, Diablo 3, the new expansion. Um, these guys shoot little laser beams, just like this. You see it takes more than 10, but the thing is, it's a higher DPSing thing. It doesn't do just like one damage. The beams do damage as they go across. So this right here is going to give you a basic, what they would call a death ball. And this is very powerful. And not you, actually not very important, but still. And you'll get in there and you'll generally see armies just like this. They'll go in, they'll do things like force field the army in half. For some reason, I don't got force fields, but that's alright. It's a weird unit building thing. Force field your army in half. You get your zealots up front. The cannon, or uh, sorry, the tank damage and kind of hold them back a little bit more. More or less cannon fodder. These are ranged, so they can hit from behind. These are ranged, they can hit from behind. These are ranged, they can hit from behind. These have further range once you get the upgrades, such as thermal lance. Uh, I didn't build that, did I? No, I did not. You got a robotics facility which provides upgrades for these, and that provides an upgrade called Thermal Lance. Which gives these guys actually an even greater range, as you can see. Um, so that's very important. What you do is you kind of get this whole line up. They use force fields just cut the enemy in half, and then they just do sh dish out a whole crap ton of damage. Um, this raider is a very good size army, actually. So Breaking this is a whole other thing, and that's where I'll talk about that a little more into the next one. For now, we'll go over to the Zergs. As it's going a little more in it. Got these guys going on for the Zerg army. As I mentioned, you already got Zerglings. The Zergs, you're going to have basic structures. Now, unlike Protoss, where you can take a probe and drop this anywhere and then drop your buildings and do whatever you want, which will lead to things like proxy attacks or cannon rushes, which I'll get into more later. Um, Zerg has to build all their structures on this kind of grayish purple, which is called creep. So they'll go through and they'll drop spawning pool. Which is what you need to build these Zerglings. Again, this is just an editor, so I have access to all the units before you normally would. And then you can drop things for upgrades. Which I didn't go over at Protoss, but I'll show you. An evolution chamber. You got a Roach. Again, this is a staple kind of early mid-game transition. Then usually you can keep them in the late game even. Um, a lot of Zerg units are good for most of the game once you get them. I mean, you can always find a reason to use them. Some things like Protoss, um, uh, good centuries out. They're good for force field and they're good with an army. Um, they're good at support. They're crap all alone. Um, whoop. I'm going to cut that camera over. Um, Lings can be decent on their own. Um, you get a big enough numbers, you can do counter attacks because they're quicker. Um, Zerg also gets a speed boost on creep, as you'll notice from off. So from here, you build the roaches. Uh, there you go. These are roaches. They are armored units. Again, what they do is they get a um, damage increase from the immortals. So I can actually take... I, uh, I don't know the exact numbers. Three, maybe? Four? It's actually more than that, I believe. We'll have them meet out here. If they can meet up, and I'll show you. Well, I'm attack each other. You'll see which one obviously wins that battle. <laughs> and then you're going to see something called the Lair. Unlike the Nexus, which doesn't change at all. The Zerg has to constantly build specific buildings, such as a pool, in order to access their Lair. And then you can build this Lair. When the Lair is done, you have to build an infestation pit, which I can build now for the sake of time. And this will allow you to upgrade your Lair and then into a Hive, which again unlocks a higher tech tree. Your more powerful creatures and everything else. Everything hinges around this. This is a crucial building. Very, very critical. If you lose this, you can lose a lot of your tech. Only because if you, generally if you lose this, you're going to lose one or two of these structures. 
If you were to lose this, you cannot rebuild this. You definitely can't rebuild this till you build another hatchery. Upgrade the hatchery to a lair, and then you can drop another infestation pit. Uh, so, this is something you always want to keep alive. And then, a lot of times you watch casters, you'll see them getting excited over certain things. And I'll go over that in a minute. But that kind of goes on. Once this finished, again, you have access to your infestation pit. You can drop your hydralis den. You can also drop your spire. So you're going to get these tech buildings at lair. These are all available with your normal hatchery. Once you have the gas and minerals to actually do it. And then once you upgrade to your hive, which that will take a minute. You actually have access to your, another tier, which is your ultraless cavern. And you can turn your spire into what is a greater spire. So I'll start that as well. Now, with the hydralis gen, what I'll let you do. Uh, wrong ones. Is build these guys. Um... I don't even think they're that fast in the game and normally. <laughs> That's about right. It's about as fast as they get. These guys are up upgrades. They have high DPS, low armor. Um, again, these are great if you can put them behind roaches, for example. Um, they got the range. Roaches also shoot at range, but they have a melee attack depending on what distance they are at. So if I do this, you kind of see how this goes. He's only taking a max 10 per each hit, and then he starts to take more damage here. But you can see if you can get one of these guys out. It's a lot more uh, effective. You get two of these, the damage model increases, and it gets pretty insane. Unlike Zerg, well, Zerg does too, I believe now, um, with HOTS. I'm a Wings of Liberty guy. I'm still trying to get used to it. I'm an on and off gamer here. <laughs> with uh, Protoss units, their shields will constantly regenerate. Um, Terran has certain uh, medevacs that allow him to do it. And then Zerg will self-heal, as you can see in the bottom, which is nice, but it really depends. You're usually not going to be out of a fight long enough to get the full health. Mutas, on the other hand, which come from this building, um, are great. They heal a little bit faster. Um, they're a very mobile unit. They can shoot down and up, but they have something called uh, Gleave, I believe is uh, how you pronounce it. What it does is it actually bounces between units. Let's see if I can demonstrate here. I'll put them up there. What that'll do is as each hit will actually bounce between units. So once you get all that and then again you upgrade to your hive, you can access, like I said, to your greater spire and you have your ultralisk cavern. Generally, you're not going to see many ultralisk. It's not something that gets used all too often in this game. Um, it's just disappointing. I always enjoy using them. You'll see a lot more broodlords, but broodlords are going to come from... These guys, Corruptors, they're a little bit slower, but they do a lot more damage than Mutalisks. Mutalisks have speed, you can get in and out, you can harass worker lines, things like that. So if I hit this, oh, it's not showing the bouncing action. Well, just trust me on that one. When you hit, the damage model will actually bounce to the next one or two closest um, guys as well as the original. So it does a little bit of a splash damage, but it's kind of a different model for splash damage. These guys are Corruptors, they only shoot air in this form. Now, Corruptors are a powerful unit, but you need something else with it. You can't just have all Corruptors, because if he shows up with anything like Hydralist, or in his case, Stalkers, you can't actually attack him. It's not possible. But they turn into Broodlords, which, vice versa, shoot only ground. They can't shoot up, so you need a good mix of Corruptor Broodlord. You're generally going to want at least two to three times more Corruptors than you are Broodlords, um, simply because... They can blink under you, snipe them, and they kind of blink out of there without doing it too much. But these are very powerful once they get up and going. And the last one, again, my ultimate favorite here is your Ultralist. These big, awesome guys right here. Now, Ultralist do a lot of damage as well. These claws go out, and it does kind of a front AoE damage. So you get a bunch of guys in a line, you can cleave them all at once, and it's it's pretty nice. And I'll show you the Broodlord attack here. It just kind of shoots out these little guys that do hit damage. So when they hit you, they do damage, and they continue attacking for their lifespan before they pop and die. You may see some of these. This is your tier 3 is what they call it, your higher level guys. You're going to have tier 2, um, tier 2.5 kind of things they're going to go over. So this is going to be your basic guys here. Now, some of the main things you want to watch, we'll get more into a little bit of the basic strategy, is your economy is important. They're going to build workers, so they show those probes here. You're going to have these guys. They're generally going to be a min mineral patch. It's not shaped like this. They'll be going back and forth getting your money, and that's what goes up. So the entire purpose, usually of the early game, is to try to harass the worker force as much as you can. And there's different ways of doing these techniques. Um, 
one of the things I didn't show you because it's not in this version of the arcade thing is you have an oracle. It's a little ball that flies around and has a very powerful, fast attack that can actually destroy a middle line, especially if you're not paying attention. But we're talking code S here. They're professionals. You're not going to see too much of that going on here. Um, but it comes down to really economy and managing it as well as supply. Now, when I say supply, you can't see it again on the screen, but this very top one is it limits how many of these guys you can have. It's a 200 supply overall max, but for every one of these buildings, it only unlocks a certain amount of supply. So you have to kind of decide, all right, am I going to use that little bit of supply I'm awarded right now to build more guys to give me more money or to build units in order to defend or attack? So this is where the strategy starts to come in that I'll get into more later. I'll show you some examples, um, try to get some good replays, and that'll play more off like that. And it's a balance mostly of economy, and then there's army strength. If you're better at using your army, you can utilize it effectively. And you're going to have a good chance at winning, but it will not guarantee you the game. However, if you can do a lot of damage to one guy's economy, if you can shut down bases, keep from expanding, um, constantly probe harass or drone harass, then you're going to have a better chance. Your economy will get up. You'll have more guys quicker than him. And you'll have more upgrades because you could have more resources to spend on those types of things. So, those are all nice to look for. And uh, I guess I'll go over basic defensive structures. I'm sure you'll see a couple of these. These are basically cannons. They shoot up, they shoot down, and they also detect cloaked units. Alright. Staple thing. There's a lot of uh, what they call cheese, and I'll go over that again early game. But, very staple unit. Zerg doesn't have a one-fits-all kind of unit. They do have... You have spines, and you have spores. Now, spores are nice. They do bonus damage to um, bio, which, you know, is balanced they had to put in for meter harassing and things like that. But it can only shoot up. This can only shoot down. It has decent range, and it does pretty good damage, actually. So, these are good. And they can also be up, moved around. But they can only, build, they can only be built on creep. Again, Zerg buildings, structures, anything like this is all limited to this purple area. No matter what you try to do, you can't build off it. Um, now, when it comes to Zerg supply and supply management, there's a little different. They use what are called overlords. Basically, it's a slow flying guy, and this is their supply, their pylon. They don't need to build under it. That's not important. You can, actually. But it flies around. You'll see a lot of times early game, they'll send this across the map towards the enemy, and they use it to scout. It has rather good vision compared to most other things, and it can be pretty useful early game for scouting you want to see what kind of gas and things they're using and going um again i mentioned you could build under it and they have something that called uh, creep you can basically <laughs> drop it and then if you really wanted to you can build something on it um once the creep goes away though these buildings start to get damaged and they die then you got overseers which these turn into remember these are still supply though so every time one of these dies you lose supply just like any time one of these is destroyed you lose supply now, an overseer is a little different. It does your detection for you. This also does detection. And it'll allow you to do a couple different abilities. One of them is called a changeling, this little guy. Once he gets close to an enemy, he actually changes into a zealot <laughs> for Protoss, for example. Or a zergling for Zerg or a marine for Terran. He can't attack. And he's invisible to him unless they have some sort of detection available to him. And it allows you to get little bits of information and whatnot. Generally, don't see it too much in high-level games, um, just because they do so well at being able to read the signs they see and what's going on. They don't need it so much. The other thing you're going to have is what's called contaminate. Um, I don't have enough energy for it, but what it does is you can throw that down in a building, for example, Prodox building, and it'll stop all production out of that building for a predetermined amount of time, which is 30 in-game seconds, not actually 30 real seconds. Um, so that's just kind of a basic overview. Um, the Zerg also has a unit that's not in this game, like I mentioned with the Oracle. And that's, well, I have two units. They have the Viper, which is a flying unit similar to this, which is a spellcaster. It allows you to pull units, blind units. Um, it's useful in the right situations, but it's not generally worth teching to it, getting them built out, waiting all that time, and then trying to find that, you know, few good times when you can really get something out of it. The other unit that comes out is called a Swarm Host. Um, I don't know if you played the first Starcraft. Kind of like a Lurker, but not really at all. <laughs> it burrows underground. It sends out those locusts that look just like this. 
Well, not just like that. Similar to this. <laughs> they send out little locusts with the lifespan. They head out. They do a lot of damage. And it's pretty much an infinite army supply. So they're great. The problem is when they're underground, they can't move. So you got them burrowed and they can't do too much. The other one you probably won't see too much of, but you may, are called infestors. Um, these guys are also spellcasters. They can continue to bur burrow underground. Um, that won't finish in time. They can move around the map. They can spit out what's called infested terrans. Little eggs that turn into marines that shoot guns, which are great. Um, these used to be used a lot for mineral line harassment and stuff a while ago when you get a lot of infester builds. And then they do something called fungal growth, which will allow you to basically halt a unit, which is something you may see if there's a lot of blink stalkers. What it does is if it, these are fungal, they can't blink. So if they blink into a fight, get caught by chain fungals, basically one after another keeps it still. It really allows you to deal with this blinking a whole lot better than you may otherwise have to deal with it. Um, the Zerg main army, as I mentioned with Protoss, is Protoss is all about a little bit slower army. They're a lot higher cost, but they're a lot more powerful. Um, they're generally, well not generally, they're always more cost effective units um, fight wise. Again, you got one immortal kill, three roaches. I mean, that's purely cost effective. Zerg, on the other hand, their units are a little bit cheaper. That immortal is going to cost you, at, off the top of my head, I think it's 150 minerals, 150 gas. Don't quote me. Um, well, a roach sample only costs 75 minerals, 75 or 25 gas. So, mineral-wise, it's expensive, but you get a lot more minerals in the game than you do gas. You're limited to only two gas, as you'll see in other videos, and the whole chain of minerals to get your resources from. So, it's really about managing it. With Zerg, you can get a lot more guys a lot quicker. You generally get a lot of strong early roach pushes. But again, if you get two mortals out in just a couple of these sentries right here, um, you can really just do a lot of damage. You use things like high ground. Um, again, if you can get some zealots up front to tank most of that damage and just keep your mortals alive a little bit longer, they dish out a ton of damage. So if you see any you know fast roach builds out of anybody during this GSL coming up, you can guarantee that Zest, who's going to be a Protoss player, is going to be building immortals and using them rather effectively. Um, I think that's it for the basics. It was a lot of information. Um, just trying to give you... Just, the more you hear it, the more you see it, the more you understand it. Um, it's pretty much the simplest way to it. It's always going to be a little bit more complex, especially when you start watching it for the first time, and you're going to kind of get a little thrown off. But if you can kind of see it and see what's going on, then you hear someone like, you know, Tasteless go, oh, look, <laughs> Dark Shrine, you know what that means. And, of course, everyone's like, yeah, I know what that means. Obviously, <laughs> I play StarCraft. If you've never seen it, you're like, I don't know what the hell a Dark Shrine is. That, that makes no damn sense to me. <laughs> And then you're going to see these little guys running across the field. Maybe you'll be like, oh, wait, those are, you know, Dark Templar. Uh, even though you can see them, they're invisible to the enemy, and they do a lot of damage. So these are also great for little sneak attacks, little, you know, poking and prodding and going around and everything else. Um, another thing you might hear when they talk early game, which, again, I'll get to, but when you watch a lot of casting, they do like to use a lot of uh, kind of what they call common sense commentary well, that's what i call it anyways you know they'll talk like oh look you know uh zest is going early gas and you'll look over and he'll have two early gas geysers and of course again if you don't watch starcraft on no starcraft you're like who cares right <laughs> i i don't get what two early gas means what in you know basic sense is he's teching for something he's trying to get as much gas he can so he can build these more you know gas effective units because remember these aren't gas effective these buildings don't cost gas to make so why would you need all that gas right when you kind of look at it and you got to kind of analyze it yourself while they're talking although the casters like tasteless and artosis you'll see probably um they're great right they know the game very very well they always talk about the game and they usually try to give you some background they do try to dumb it down um but occasionally you know you get caught up especially when there's a lot of things going on and you, you tend to leave out the guy who may not know so much about the game but they they do a really well good job um, with dealing with that so again we'll get into that more little early builds what it means early gas proxies um, cheese all that will be in the early along with early defense um, quick plays and whatnot that'll be in the next video and then we'll go to the mid game which is where you're gonna get a lot of your good fighting that's where you can get a lot of harassing your first major engagement if it's a macro style game um, 
And then you go to late game. Late game is where it can get really interesting. That's where you generally end up having a massive ball bigger than this. Um, problem again, mobility. You see it's slow. And then you got, you know, Zerg, for example, will have a bunch of bases. You'll see creep spread. They're trying to find ways to break this. And that's what the late game comes down to. Um, for Zerg, you really don't want them to get this death ball. This kind of critical mass, which is bigger than this, trust me. <laughs> you don't want them to get that because it's very, very hard to deal with. And once something like this is in your base, if he uses chokes properly, he can, you know, force field your ramp and you can't even get your uh, the other units to him. and cut one of your army in half. It is... Is a problem, right? It's it's very difficult to do. Again, these are pro players; they know how to do it. But the kind of late games where it gets really exciting because even with an army like this, it, if you play it right, you can take this out fairly easily. You can shut it down. You can win that, and that's where you'll see them look more at you know flanking routes and different maneuvers, and you'll see different types of macro, and it gets really really intense late game. Early game, you get a lot of other um, different things such as cheese and then early pressures, which also are very tense. Um, you make a mistake early game like that, it's over. Um, you can lose, especially if you know you get one DT in your base, you don't have detection, and he just takes out your entire mineral line, you're done. Right? There's not much you can do at that point. You can try to rebuild your, you know, economy, but then you got to realize that his economy has still been up and booming this entire time. He still has more guys. You had one guy in there. It's Again, it's a complex thing. It's a very delicate balance later on, but hopefully just understanding the basic guys here will give you uh, somewhat of a stepping stone. I recommend you go out, you watch some videos. Um, like I said, Day 9 does a lot of analytical things. He gets really into it. Um, you can Google Day 9 with Newbie Tuesday. He'll get you bare bones, breakdown. If you've never played, he'll explain things to you, timings, builds, things like that. But, I mean, you can just go on Google, find things. Husky, he does a lot of commentary, um, a lot of funnier stuff too. So... It's a great community, a lot of things out there, so hopefully I gave you some things to look at. Um, make sure you check out uh, Caldor's video if you're kind of curious at, you know, his sort of stance on this. Um, again, he's a good commentary, Day 9, so definitely check out Team Liquid if you have any questions. They're always friendly over there. Um, Reddit, you can. Um, again, Reddit's, if you've ever been there, you know how they are. Sometimes they're great and wonderful people, sometimes they're just dicks. <laughs> But, you know, the good comes with the bad. So uh, make sure you like, subscribe if you didn't like it. You know what? Hit that don't like button. Make sure you remind me why. Show up every day just so you can remind me why you didn't like this video. Um, and I should hopefully be coming out tomorrow and every day up to Friday morning, which will be the morning of with my mid-game, early game, mid-game, late game videos. Um, hopefully I don't get delayed and thrown off too much. So make sure you check back for those and you have a good day.